Well, man, hello there, Brandon. It's been uh, been a couple of weeks since I've seen you over here. Look how much fatter my face looks since last time that we were on together. <laughs> I felt yes. that today. Yeah, like I'm puffy. And I don't mean to, but you know what? Things are back to normal a little bit. I, I found since like uh, after the fight, I've been like forcing myself to eat like shit again. And it's like, I don't even like to really eat like, I, I, like just things that are available are not good. And they put on a ton of weight, but I don't even like want to, I want to stay skinny and stay in good shape. And it's like, uh, this food's kind of making me feel disgusting. But you know, the one thing that, uh, I, I had been dying to have since the fight and, and order is restored. Do you know what that is? What's that? That is, uh, back to basics. Shout out to our sponsor, LaCroix, the one and only the lemon cello. You know, we got some good stuff going on when, when we bring back the lemon cellos and the coffee. That's a dangerous combination. Now, I have a lot of questions and a lot to say. First of all, I, I haven't had a lemon cello, I feel like, in weeks. I, I don't know what my wife is up to, Kindle, but I don't have it in my house. And I feel like it hasn't been in my house for weeks. Might be time to longer. pull the plug. I don't know what's going on. There's no calories in limoncello. I don't know. It's not like we're on a healthy kick. Well, first of all, I'm not healthy. But even if I were, limoncello wouldn't be what I cut. But it's not in my house. And all order is it, my house is chaos now because of that. <laughs> oh, I just got to look. I just got to look, a look, a look. Uh, I'm going to shut up. But why haven't you been drinking limoncello? Well, you know, somebody had told me this and I, I think it was really true. Like when I was cutting weight, drinking these, these, uh, um, like carbonated, you know, uh, like the sparkling waters, it dehydrates you and it makes you so thirsty. So every night I would get home from training and I'd, you know, crack one, have one or two. And then I just kept drinking so much water at night, so much water, which I, you know, I guess is fine ish, but it was like, I'd rather just drink real water instead of the you know, the one that just keeps making me so dehydrated and so much more thirsty. So I just cut them out completely. And honestly, as soon as I started cutting them out, my weight started dropping like instantly. Um, so couldn't wait. To I don't have know if after. I buy that. I don't know if I buy that. I feel Maybe like it's that's, a mental thing. That's like yeah, the old wrestler's like, tale, like the lemon juice at night. But Hey, if it, if yeah. it works, it works. I feel like you got placeboed into your own placebo. <laughs> That's okay. It saved me a ton of money. Not that LaCroix are expensive, guys. You should go buy no, them right now. Very affordable. Use our discount code. Uh, yeah, so I was gone. I was in London. You were in Austria. Been world traveling, and now we're back here. Hey, um, bets and breakdowns paying nice. We got some bets and breakdowns paying nice. I sat in that business class seat. I got to lay down on the airplane. Now, one one gripe, and uh, I, I don't know how your flight to London was. So the first time I ever traveled overseas, I actually went to London. Um, I was 16 years old. I saved up all of the money that I had to go compete in a white belt juvenile tournament in London. Let me repeat that again. A white belt juvenile tournament in London. There was nobody within four weight classes of me and one match at like 160 pounds. I was 120 at the time. White belt juvenile tournament in London. Um, but the coolest part of the trip was, uh, going to Hodger Gracie's. Um, I saw that you saw a lot of the cool stuff. Um, uh, Westminster Abbey, you saw like the, the churches and the museums, the bridge, the London eye that was like overwhelming for me at the time. It was so cool. Uh, but the highlight of my life was like my 65 year old grandpa just sitting and talking to like legend of the sport, Hodger Gracie about me. And Hodger like looked at me and said, Hey, someday he'll be something, man. He really will. And, you know, seeing him all the time at like worlds. And he always remembered me, this little tiny white belt. Uh, I, I love London except for the food. The food's horrible. The food is horrible. So, I mean, it's not the worst. It's just nothing has flavor. No, it is the worst. You and can be honest. No, I've had worse. Like going other places, like there, there's a bunch of weird food in the world and London is not the worst for me. But see, I didn't get first class or anything because the UFC paid for my ticket. And the UFC is the cheapest company on the planet. Fight or pay, baby. So, man, it was, a, it was a brutal trip getting over there. I mean, we had a five or six hour layover in Denver. Our, our flight back, I had a six hour layover in uh, San Francisco. Like, I, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. But JSP got the win. Um, a lot of Maquan uh, Americani uh, <laughs> people out there got shut up. You know, I, th I think a lot of people were, were giving you some shit over that. And I think, 
you broke it down exactly how it was going to be broken down and JSP JSP'd. Well, the, the, okay. The frustrating thing is like, okay, everybody sits down and they, they break down a fight and they're like, okay, well, Mach 1 is going to hit us Anaconda in the first round. And then if not, he'll get tired. And people will tell you what an idiot you are for picking JSP. Just like we say this all the time, the better fighter wins 90% of the time. Like you can't bet on a fight and go, well, if he does that, like if he can get this and pray that if he gets this, like it's pretty, it's pretty binary. It's pretty easy to like when somebody has one trick it's pretty easy to defend that one trick. And, you know, I guess the best example of that would be even a few weeks ago, Chris Curtis versus Hadolfo Vieira. He's got one strong blast double. And what did Chris Curtis do? He just defended one blast double. Then you look at him on the London card and he gets beat up in a completely different way. When somebody has one trick, one thing, it is easy to defend. And I, I was telling Locke last week in your absence, uh, by the way, probably a better co-host. Side the point. Infinitely uh, better. Infinitely better. The uh, the uh, the whole card was like a, a full card of people who who do one thing and like one thing really really well. And I saw so much love on Twitter. Like, okay, I'm running a Mach One by sub parlay and a Paul Craig by sub parlay. And I was like, guys, this is not the move on this one. It, you know, neither of them are going to win probably. It, but the, my problem is, is people talk so confident, you know, confidently uh, to me on Twitter. People tweeting about me all week. Like, what weirdos, man? I didn't even follow these people. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't see a lot of money line tickets on Mach one, right? People will throw in like a first round sub, you know, Hey, cool. Like I respect that. You know, th that's my read on the fight too. He's either going to win by that or it's going to be JSP all day, but people talk so vehemently and they're just so, so aggressive with it, but not really like, and I'm not one to like call somebody out and be like, well, let me see the cash. But it's like, you have no faith, no confidence for what you're even saying. And you're trying to call somebody else an idiot and, and talk about their intelligence where's your conviction? Show me the ticket then. You know, how, how much do you believe in this? Cause I will respect your opinion if you believe in it, but I put $1,500 on JSP straight up. That's how much I believed in it because you know, a week before the fight, he told me to start with a full Anaconda locked on and I've got these short flyweight arms and I'm pretty, pretty damn good at jujitsu. He let me start full on and I couldn't submit him to save my life. And you know, I've trained with you for years. I think you're one of the two guys on planet earth that have anaconda me in the last decade Kamala Kirk who's got an amazing anaconda and a great squeeze like he's training with great guys you know the the read to me was was pretty simple you have a guy with cardio versus a guy with no cardio and one trick you know it, yeah so we saw that a lot too I mean the Paul Craig one that was my lock of the card and I wasn't on the show with you and stuff but I, I put stuff on the patreon and on the discord of just some picks and, and what I liked and that was kind of the same thing like dude Paul Craig has to pull guard hope that um gosh geez I don't even remember um who the Vulcan hell Ozdemir. The yeah Ozdemir geez I couldn't uh hope that Ozdemir just went full idiot stayed in his guard and did it. I mean, and, and Paul Craig actually looked better on his feet than you would expect. He had some moments uh, on his feet that were better than I think the moments on the ground. Um, but you've got to hope that the one trick pony can pull off that hat trick. And, and these one trick ponies do it well early in the UFC when people haven't seen the, the film, when they don't know about them, like that is it. But once they, once people start finding out about it, it doesn't work again and again and again and again. It's like Ryan Hall. He was great until people had film on him. And Topurio was like, yeah, go Baron Bolo, somebody else. I'm going to kill you now. Um, you, you know, and that's it. That's that's the fight that was the card. Um, I guess it depends on the kind of that. one trick that you have. It, like like Khabib was a one trick pony, but it was the best trick you could ever have. But it was a it was a series of tricks, not one trick. No, you, know, you got Khabib Ronnie Yaya. Yeah, exactly. I do not think of Khabib as a one trick. That is a stylistic. Um, he is one dimensional in style, but he's not a one trick. That's pony. I guess what one I'm trick. Saying. Yeah. yeah, one trick pony is somebody that just they need to land that big all arm maker bars. or bust. Yeah, exactly. All yeah. arm bars, all guillotines, all things like that, or nothing else. Um, but no, I mean, did this I just mean, prove Khabib my point was, this week that jujitsu does it doesn't work? It's not real. It doesn't work anymore in MMA. Uh, we talked about it the other, you know, a couple weeks ago. The, the split in sport jujitsu right now in like submission grappling and MMA grappling is, is they're so far removed from one another. It's insane. Um, I, I yeah. had to have a moment with myself when I was in Austria, uh, by the way, you know, I got to shout out my 
I, I don't know if it's taboo if I'm allowed to be wearing like a, a different team, but my my Henzo Gracie uh, Austria friends, I know they'll never see this, but shout out to them anyways. But actually, like a weird moment came to me when I was learning. So my my friend who's a John Donaher black belt, Arturo Wesson, phenomenal teacher. I mean, one of the best teachers I've ever seen in my life. And a moment came to me when he was teaching, and I said, "Listen, if he's he's showing." Donaher stuff, right? Gordon Ryan, Donaher, Gary Tonin, like the top guys in the world. And as he's showing this, there's so many little intricacies and details. And I, I, I told myself like, Hey, if I ever had ambitions of being the best in the world in jujitsu, I really couldn't compete MMA anymore. Like I would, I, I would have to stop and spend eight hours a day doing this and only this to compete at a high level. And then also do enough steroids and hope my athleticism could meet, you know, the rest of the guys. I, I, and I'm I, weirdly, I'm not kidding. You know, it's no, it's not at test. all. And that's like a really crazy part of the whole thing too. So actually seriously, yes. But also the technique is just like, it, it's beating on your craft so much where MMA and this is real has so much to cover I mean, you're going to get these specialists, but then they're lacking in so many other areas. So you, I mean, it's just, where do you spend your time to be at the highest level of this one little piece, or you can be amazing everywhere, or you have one glaring weakness. But I, it was just in that moment. I was like, okay, when I was a kid, I would always wanted to be a black belt world champion, right? That's all of our ambitions. And then somewhere along this trip, I was like, maybe not in my cards, maybe not in my future. I can be very good, but it's not going to be, uh, you know, top of the top. Yeah, if you want to be good at MMA, again, there's only amount, there's a certain amount of time that you have to spend on everything. You have wrestling, you have your striking, you've got your jujitsu, but then you've got strength and conditioning, and that is starting to be one of the biggest areas of our sport that matter. So you just have to be, and you, you as a as a fighter, you know, as somebody who's been around me for a long time, you've heard me say this a million times. It's not who's better at com it's who comes off the stool fresher in round two. Like that's it, man. You can be as good is there, there's a, there's a weird scale of algorithm or something of sorts of skill to cardio. And if you're so much better than somebody, your cardio doesn't have to be quite as good, but if you're somewhat equal in skill level, maybe even just a little bit better, well, then you need to have way better cardio because that, that it balances out and man, give me somebody who's just tough and decent, but really good cardio over somebody who is phenomenal, um, with, with questionable cardio skills. How many guys have we seen like that over the years? Like, like Tony Ferguson might be one of the best examples ever. He wasn't really that good ever, but he just was as tough as they come and has great cardio and people break and fold and then he beats them, you know, that's it. That is it, man. Cardio is King. Cardio is King. Well, let's get into this week's card. Um, cause we've got, this is a decent, I guess there's only 13 fights. It seemed like there was like a hundred on here when I was doing film. Um, you know, and before we do, we actually have a new sponsor, you guys, uh, betonline.ag. So we, we don't have everything figured out yet. We don't have everything finalized. We don't have our code, uh, but they will be joining us soon. So in the next week or so, um, you know, we really like bet online and we, we sought them out because they, they just have a better interface. They actually have something, you know, my bookie was fine. You know, I mean, we, we did some stuff with them. We appreciate the the work that they did with us, but bet online's interface, their props, their bets, their lines, uh, the entire app, everything about it. I tend to like a lot more. You quote them a lot. We reference bet online a lot, just in our props. Oh, bet online has this bet bet online has that bet. So they're going to be joining us shortly. Um, and then of course you guys, if you haven't checked out my memoir, go check that out. Link in the show notes. Um, now let's get to it. Let's get to it. Who do we have? We have Orion Ko Koski, uh, and blood diamond who is like sting who doesn't even go by like a full name anymore. He's just blood diamond. Um, kick it off, kick it off for us, Brandon. Oh, pardon me. Well, you know, if last card was the card of, uh, one trick ponies and setup fights, I think a lot of this card is a lot of the, uh, the unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns on this card. Um, you know, kicking it off the, the blood diamond fight, right? You know, I, I've seen a lot of chatter of like, okay, well, well, Jeremiah Wells had to really struggle to get blood diamond down. Jeremiah Wells is offensive grappling is to me, not that good. I mean, we have spent a lot of time and I think Jeremiah Wells is a fine fighter. I mean, obviously he's had a great UFC career so far. He knocked out court McGee. He's got this big power in his hands, but when we were watching tape, his offensive 
cage wrestling is really not amazing, especially with the gym that he's at. And you compare that to the likes of Sean Brady, Pat Sabatini, right? These guys who are using foot trips and body locks and just such great stuff. So did Jeremiah Wells have a tough time taking him down? Yes, absolutely. Because he came out like an ape, body locked him and is trying as hard as he can to just throw him over and use sheer strength instead of, you know, a redirection or, a, you know, chain, chain wrestling, catching him on the cage, right? He, he purely muscled that. So yes, Jeremiah Wells made that look as tough as he possibly could. Now on the ground though, that's where, you know, it, it got a little iffy, right? It, Jeremiah Wells is a Daniel Gracie black belt. He's, he's very fine in jujitsu. But Blood Diamond really didn't do a single thing right, like like not hopping to the right direction, not controlling his hips, not standing up. There wasn't one thing that he did right. He he, he looked like a guy who ends up on his back and is like, okay, what now? You know what now? Um, you know, you know. On, on the other side of things, you got Koski who who just lost to uh, Phil Rowe. Now Phil Rowe is brown belt in jujitsu. He's six foot three. He's extremely athletic. Honestly, even in the UFC, for most guys, it's really tough to take down people that are that tall. And Koski got it done, was controlling him and doing really well. He actually let Phil Rowe back up, which was kind of the surprising part. Um, you know, obviously there's cardio concerns there too, but how do we know how good Blood Diamond's cardio is? We we really don't know. You know, we don't have a ton of film. We don't have a ton of film when guys are hanging on him and and wrestling him. Um, he's much smaller than Phil Rowe was. So you know, what could happen is blood diamond all of a sudden is D one blood diamond. And he, he defends every takedown and has this phenomenal kickboxing, but I, I don't think the disparity in the, in the striking is going to be as, as much as people think. I think Koski's fine for an MMA fighter. He swings hard. He's got decent fundamentals, but all the grappling upside here is on Koski, you know, blood diamond. He could be, how old is he listed as 34, He's like 34. He could be 34. He could be 84. I, you know, honestly, look at his face. He's like Benjamin Button. We don't really know how old he is. I, I, you know, forget Obama's birth certificate. I want to see Blood Diamond's birth certificate. So um, I, I like Koski here. I think in, in retrospect, Koski is probably going to look like, wow, that was the no brainer bet of the century. But again, we don't know. You know, obviously, he, you know, could get knocked out. You know, he gets tired, whatever. But uh, I, I'm going to go Koski on this one. Yeah, I mean, Koski, let's look at the odds right here. He's uh, minus 185 and Blood Diamond is plus 150. Um, I, I mean, you said it with with Blood Diamond in his last fight. I, I mean, it, he was tall and awkward. And uh, how tall is he? He's 5'11. So he's not super tall, but he stands tall. Like he's tall on the cage, if that makes sense. Where he's not low and just. You know, it's almost like those guys who don't wrestle and then you come in to wrestle them and they're harder to take down than people who know how to wrestle because it's just awkward and they don't move right. That's almost what Blood Diamond did against Jeremiah Wells, who, like you said, was, I think, thinking that he was just going to pick him up and throw him down. And that didn't happen. And eventually he did just pick him up and throw him down. But it was like, all right, I've got to actually try to do this. He thought he was just going to fall down for him. And, and Wells, like you said, probably has the least, you know, proficient cage grappling out of those Daniel Gracie guys out of Philly. Um, once it hit the ground, that was a wrap. Um, Koski is good. I mean, he, he, I, I mean, is he a world-class kickboxer? No. I, I mean, he stands a little square. He's a little awkward. But also standing. his blood diamond. We don't really know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, blood diamond is he fighting is like, Nikki Holskin? No, he's just, I mean, he looks fine, but he is not. I think we saw him get dropped in one of his uh, fights before he even got to the UFC, and he recovered. But yeah, he does. He's not a world beater. There's not a lot of tape on him. I mean, Koski is is proficient. He's a decent wrestler. His grappling good is good. Um, a good camp, he, even against Roe. I mean, he got rocked. And I mean, first of all, he got hit a few times and wore it well. Then even after he was rocked, he recovered well. He kept fighting. And Philip Rowe is a tall, rangy, gangly guy with good jujitsu. I mean, I, this is this is a no-brainer here, you guys. I mean, we can't bet on what we don't know. You can only bet on what you know. And we know that Koski is proficient. We know he's got good cardio. We know he's ready to wrestle. We know he comes from a good camp. I mean, Blood Diamond comes from a good camp too. He just doesn't have enough experience and he doesn't have enough experience in cage grappling. I think Koski is the easy play here. Um, it, you know, again, Hey, crazier shits happen. We have not seen blood diamond fight a lot, so we don't have a lot of tape. He could go out and, you know, throw a flying knee right off the bat. But 
uh, again, generally the better fighter wins. And I think that's Koski here. I, I was blood diamond a favor for, for Izzy just getting his boys in the UFC. I mean, I feel like we've I seen think that a so. few times. Cause I think we saw him come in and we saw somebody else come in on, on the same card. I forget who it was, both of whom were, um, now we saw, yes, we saw that. And then I think we saw in a contender series the same week that they fought, um, somebody else show up. So yeah, I think, I think this was a, uh, Izzy favor. All right. Next up, we got Nick Negamaranu versus Ihor Pateria. Okay. Kick so, this one off. yeah. So, so Negamaranu is plus 110. Uh, Pateria is minus 130. And I, I mean, I will say more than this, but I really don't need to say more than this. Negamaranu opened up at like a plus 160 or something like that. And now he's already down to plus 110. And we still have four or five more days before the fight happens. I think that shows that people in the know have looked at Proteria and are like, oh, yeah, I, I'm not sold. Uh, he's got a 20-2 uh, and two record, all right? He, he won on the Contender Series. Hey, he threw – he blitzed a very good – I think it was a left-hand, right-hand, and just, just blitzed his opponent, caught him off guard, whatever. It looked good. Um, before that, beat a guy 5-2 and two and a guy 11-5. and five. Uh, Georgie Kuba Jesh Feli and Georgie loves blah, blah, blah. Um, go look at those fights. I, I mean, one of those guys is like my uncle off the couch who's like eating pasta and then is like, all right, I'm tough. I'm going to go fight. I, I mean, the, the Franco other eating pasta. Got, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, these are just these guys. I don't know how they're five and two or 11 and five. I mean, it's just unreal to me. And, and then you go down. 0 and 2, 0 and 4, 0 and 3, 0 and 0, 1 and 9, 0 and 0, 0 and 0, 1 and 2. Now, Nega Murano's record before the UFC isn't too much better. Um, but I, I mean, if you watch Proteria, like, I mean, he's tall, he's fast, he's fast, and he will fight. Like, there's that. He, he'll get taken down with a stiff breeze. Um, he, he got dropped in his last fight before the UFC. And then the guy just jumped in his guard and got triangled. Um, I, I mean, I'm not huge on Nega Murano, All right. Nega Murano's chin up. He's square in his stance. He, he, his chin gets even higher as he punches. He kind of runs into stuff. He, he's clunky. He's awkward, but man, he's an actual fighter. He has actual wins. He's got a chin on him for days. He's got cardio. He presses forward. Um, I mean, Proteria can absolutely catch him early in uh, in the fight. Just man, starch him, find some stuff. Just just catch his chin. Um, he's a southpaw, but his hands he he reaches with his hands. He he is not adept on the ground outside of like a basic armbar triangle. He's not defending shots. Uh, honestly, outside of just being kind of tall and rangy and just fast, I mean, he is the Jordan Wright of Eastern Europe. I mean, he, he's going to go out there, he's going to blitz, and, and it's going to be a whirlwind of, of a first couple of minutes. And he could Jordan Wright some stuff. Jordan Wright has beaten some decent people who are way better than him just by blitzing them right off the bat. But if he can't win in that first initial blitz, man, I, I think Nega Morano is just tough and a solid play here. Um, I, I think he's just going to be in his face. And Nega Morano could make it really easy by just taking it to one clinching him, put him up against the fence or taking it to the ground. I think if he takes it to the ground, he can easily beat him up, bully him and go. Um, I, I like Nega Morano here. I think, uh, the dog play is, is good. I wouldn't be surprised to see Nega Morano a slight favorite come fight time. Yeah. I've already, uh, I've already taken a big position in, in Nega Morano because I saw the same thing that you, that you did. Um, I, I remember it, it wasn't so, first of all, see this nose, that's a that's an Eastern Bloc sniffer. I can find the good ones and I can find the bad ones. Um, and, and I joke about this, but I'm also being you know kind of serious. Like you know, last year on the Bellator card when uh, you know Benson was fighting the Russian and Bader was fighting the Russian, and there was that other Russian on the card, right? Two out of the three Russians lost, and I said, yeah, the two of the three are going to lose, right? Um, you know, last weekend the 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 guy uh, Magomed, one of the Magomeds that fought a uh, uh, one of the local Portland guys that said, no, 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 this guy, he's for real. Like he's for real. I watched his tape. He's legit. Finished the fight in what a minute. 
And then there was the one that fought uh, Lorenz Larkin, who had a good start, right? Kind of took him down and was dominating. Gets hit with like kind of a glancing elbow. And then he's like, I'm done. He looked like he got put in a wood chopper. It was like insane. And I said, before the fight, that guy's, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Um, but I, you know, my sense is going off with Ihor also, and it's not for the record. Like, I don't really care about, the, you know, everybody's got stupid fights on their record, right? Everybody's got pumped up records and sometimes they end up looking great. And sometimes they look horrible. I mean, Henry Cejudo fought Miguelito Marty, who's two and 42 right now. So, okay. It happens guys. You know, it's, that's part of the game. That's the whole thing. Okay. But I'm seeing the same thing that, that you are with Ihor. you know, he's got a good, you know, a decent, you know, first blitz, but any Eastern block Ukraine, Russia that wins by a triangle choke or a knee bar off their back. Come on guys. Come on. You, you know, do you think Khabib's getting put on his back and, you know, and throwing up arm bars, triangles, it's not happening. Right. I, I really like Nick Negamaranu. I think he's got a good chin. I mean, how could you not love him as a dog, right? He never stops pressing forward. He made a fight close with uh, six foot four Kennedy and and Juwaku Uku, who is pretty decent. I mean, he's got really long range. He's just tough to get inside. And really tiny Nick Negamaranu made that fight really, really close, really, really competitive. Now you can argue if he won the fight. At the end of the day, he's got the W on his record. Um, it's got decent takedown defense. I think he does a lot of things well. He's at extreme couture. Um, I really like Nick here. I, I, you know, outside again of a first round blitz, I don't see a way that he loses because even in the, in that Georgie fight, right? So Ihor Pretoria's one fight before contender series, that Georgie Kuba Jashavili is five, five and eight now, right? His record is five and eight now. He's lost every fight since the Ihor fight. Um, Ihor's looking tired, man. He's looking exhausted. He looked like he was ready to give up. Now you have a guy who's real, who trains with real people and has real wins in the UFC. Uh, I, I mean, Nick beat Alexa Kamer, you know, when he, his first fight in the UFC, Alexa is a good boxer and does a lot of things well as a young, hot prospect. And he knocked him off. Now he's going to lose to Ihor Pretoria. Who's not a great wrestler has okay hands. And you know, has about a round of uh, fight in him. To me, this is an easy one. I think don't overthink this one. I, I, I like Nick Negamaranu here. Yeah, the only thing I want to say to add on to this is not only is Ihor not a great wrestler, he's a bad wrestler. Like people are taking him down with the worst, like, you know, every once in a while I help out with a kid's class wrestling or, you know, over at the gym. And when I see kids like lift a leg up and kind of twirl around and fall down on top of each other, that's the double leg that Ihor got taken down with like two fights ago. Um, if Nega Morano sneezes and falls over, he's going to take Ihor down. Uh, not that I think he necessarily will do that, but I think he could do he's that. Probably he's probably just going to run forward, chin up, and swing it hard, yeah. which is always the exactly. liability. But I still like him here. He's he's a fun fighter no, to watch. I love him. 100%. Uh, all right, next up we've got Ji Young Kim. Uh, she's 9-5 and five against Jocelyn Edwards who's 11 and four. And this is an interesting one. I'll let you kick this off in a second, but they have it listed at 135. Oh, they switched it. So initially they had it when I was looking at 125 and I was shocked because Edwards just fought uh, recently up at 145. And I saw that it was at 125. I was like, man, that has got to be a mistake. And Tapology has since adjusted it to 135. Uh, who do you got here um, on this ladies competition? My self-deprecation is going too far and it's mixing hard with my ego. I think last week on the show, I said like, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good better. I know what the hell I'm talking about, but fade every single one of my women's MMA picks. And I got people messaging me like, yeah, dude, you, man, you killed it. You're doing so good. You're awesome. But man, you suck at picking women's MMA. And then my ego takes over. I was like, what the fuck you say? Like, what the fuck? Um, you know, so now I'm in this like weird thing. Like, like, do I pick the opposite of the one that I think is going to win. So people fade me and make money according to what I think. And then either way I can say like, no, you should have faded me. I follow this guy, Ben, the better, uh, you know, on Twitter and, and Patreon and stuff like that. And he's kind of going through the same thing where you're the whole concept was you're supposed to fade everything that he, that he plays and you make a ton of money. But then he was like, okay, well I'm purposely choosing the opposite side. So people will fade it, which just means it's my real plays and then started losing. And then he was kind of in this middle zone where he was putting stuff down. And if it lost, he was like, uh, 
yeah, you should have faded the play. And then if it won, he was like, don't fade me anymore. Like I'm good now. I'm putting my real stuff. So maybe me with women's MMA, that's a great plan. I'm just going to choose one. And if it wins, guys, I know what the hell I'm talking about. Don't doubt me. If it loses, you should have faded me, man. I told you guys that shows ago. Uh, that being said, okay, I know where everybody's going with this one. Uh, every, this is everyone's dog shot, right? Everyone's going to go uh, with uh, Ji Young Kim here. I've had a long, hard road with Gian Kim. I, I give her a shot every single fight against Meatball Molly, against Priscilla Cachuara. I, I give her a I give her a shot every single fight, and every single time I'm let down. And weirdly, I don't think that's uh, going to change here. I think it's going to be the exact same thing. I think everybody's pretty sour on uh, on Jocelyn Edwards from some of her recent performances. But here's the thing: in this fight, you're getting a girl who literally has attempted zero takedowns in the UFC has never shown any grappling prowess ever. I mean, there was a little exchange, I think, in the in the Molly McCann fight, but she lost every exchange on that one, right? If she has it her way, she's she's not gonna shoot, she's not gonna go takedowns, right? She's gonna circle with her back foot on the cage and she's gonna time these really slow, really wide punches. They can be sometimes laser sharp, but they're really slow. And she's got her chin up constantly. I mean, I have never seen somebody get smashed in the face so hard as Ji Young Kim and stick around. It, it, it's really insane to me. So the way that I look at this fight, I mean, you just have two people that are going to stand up. I think Jocelyn Edwards uses her her front kicks really well, right? Just as a volume filler, a space filler. Um, she's got kind of more explosive punches, like round explosive. They just look better for the judges. I, I don't love this fight. I don't love betting on this fight because I could look like an idiot. Everyone else could look like an idiot for taking the, the underdog here and oh, plus money, all this stuff, whatever. I, I just think this is a tailor-made fight for Jocelyn Edwards in a weird way is getting someone who won't grapple with her. And I think she's got better volume, you know, just better punches in general. So I'm going to go uh, uh, Jocelyn Edwards here. I hate to agree with you on this because... I, I mean, I was really hard on Jocelyn Edwards in her uh, Ramona fight. I mean, I thought, man, I thought Pasquale was going to win that fight because I just am not big on Jocelyn Edwards. I really have never been. In in this fight, I think she's just going to out physical. What is it? Kim? Like, I don't even know. What it is. Kim Young. Young. I, I, I never know what's the first and the last name with some of these Asian fighters. Um, we need Haley on a guest spot on this thing. Oh my gosh. We do need Haley who only has one name. So that, that make it super easy. Um, but anyway, you said it. I think she's a range. She's not going to get taken down. She's not going to get out wrestled. She's not going to be out. Even if it ends up into a clinch situation on the cage, I think Jocelyn Edwards is going to win that just off of physicality. And I think she's a little bit faster. She's a little bit more athletic and she uses that front kick and, you know, has a little bit better volume uh, out of nothing more than not being the worst fighter of the, I'm not picking the better fighter here. I'm picking the worst fighter. And, and I think Kim is the worst fighter. And I think Jocelyn Edwards is a, is a margin above her. And, and I think it's going to be a, a, you know, kind of a lackluster decision win for Edwards. You know, can I say this too? Last week, I really loved a ton of the spots on the, like loved a ton of the spots on the card. This week, I, I can just be real with myself and just say like, I, I don't love a lot of spots on this card. There's like one or two and they're the most expensive ones on the card. Like, I don't really think this is a great card. Really, I think a lot of the equity in this week is in LFA, CFFC, not in UFC because of fights like this. Yeah. A hundred percent. Last week, man, I was in England, so I, I missed out on the betting. And that was the best card to ever bet in the history of all of UFC. Like you kind of knew all of, man, that was such a good card. This one, you're right. This is not a great betting card. There's a couple spots, but this isn't one, man, if, if, if you have a hundred bucks, don't bet all a hundred dollars on this card. You know, maybe drop 20 bucks on this card and then save your other 80% of your bankroll for just better cards. You know what I mean? Um, last week there were yeah. so many options. I, I, so I put in 12,000 last, well, like I had 12,000 bankroll, whatever last week just had so many options across so many different promotions, bare knuckle, uh, cage warrior. That's what it was. Cage warriors, Bellator, yada, yada, all kinds of stuff. So I put in 12,000 and I ended the week uh, with $35,000 profit just because I loved the week so, 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 so much. 
And that was 35,000. I lost 12,000 at the very end of the night, um, on bare knuckle. So if I didn't take that bet, you know, I'd be at 40, what, 42, uh, 47,000. And if I would have won the bet on the main event guy, uh, you know, it would have been even more. So, you know, you just got to pick and choose your weeks when you know it's good, when you know it's not so good. So this week, uh, you know, I'm not going to take everything that I made and, and go invest it right back into this week. Cause I'm not in love with this week. Yeah, that, that is a solid play here. Um, next up, we've got, um, Michael Morales and Adam, fuck it. Um, fuck it. I'll go. Um, and, and actually, <laughs> oh my God, that was good. I just got it right now. I just found the, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I wasn't able to find a ton of stuff on, on fuck it. You know, I saw a little bit of stuff. I saw his Solomon Remfro fight. I saw his Nick Maximov, uh, jujitsu match i think that was about all i was able to find on him you too broke um, to pay so on what pay what 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 there was the the pay-per-view on the fight tv which by the way i got a beef with fight tv i pay for like the monthly thing and i get zero things for free i still have to pay 20 dollars a pop every event that i want to watch but there was like a 15 dollar thing for his fight right before solomon oh really was there i didn't yeah, it was even, like a pay to was watch. that devin brock Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I didn't even know where to find that. You didn't miss much. Anyway. You didn't miss much. Yeah. So, uh, actually, you, you know, watch, watching his fight with Solomon and he won, that was just a weird – Solomon Renfro just stood there and just got punched and then he stood there and then he got kicked and then he stood there and then he got kicked and he stood there and he got punched until he was, like, knocked out. Like, what the hell was that? Like, that was super weird. Um Actually, I was, you know, but I, so I'm watching Fuck It, and I'm like, this is got really awkward, long, gangly, like weird stance, southpaw, like just, just looks weird. So I'm like, okay, so he got, he got that win, he got the Solomon Run for a win, and then I see him against Nick Maximov, who I expect him to just get obliterated, and he actually didn't look bad. He, he knew what he was doing against Maximov. Maximov caught him in the guillotine, but he was defending the legs, he was defending stuff. Maximov looked okay. Uh, or I'm sorry, fuck it looked okay against Maximov. So it wasn't, you know, anything crazy. Um, on, on the other side, we have Michael Morales, who they, they have him listed as like an Ecuadorian wrestling champion. But that's like saying you're, you're a special Olympics runner. I mean, it doesn't really, doesn't really mean you're, you're ready to take on Usain Bolt. Um, and then we saw in one of his fights, gosh, I even forget who it was, who just body locked him, threw him right to the ground. Um, Trevin, but Morales Trevin Giles, the last fight. Trevin Giles. Yeah, that's right. It was Trevin Giles. Um, just threw him down and, and he got back up. He did fine, whatever. And I think his wrestling is probably better than that. Probably threw him more off guard than, than anything. But I like Morales, man. Um, he, he's another guy with, with a questionable record coming up. He's 13 and 0. a beautiful freaking jab. I mean, he has a solid jab. His chin's a little high. He gets hit a little bit. Uh, but at 22, and, and again, against Giles, he was just kind of standing there. I think that was his first UFC fight, and he kind of looked a little adrenaline out during the headlights. I think it was a big moment for him, and it took him a while to start fighting. But man, once he started fighting, he is fast. He is dynamic. I love his jab. Um, he, I think he's just getting better and better and better. I don't like that he's at Entrum Gym just because... I think he needs to work more on his striking and they're definitely a grappling gym. He needs to get away from Tijuana. He needs to get, he needs to cross the border. Come over, come over to the States. You go to fight we'll ready. Fight. That's it. Come over to fight ready. We're there. I'm in. We'll, we'll take you. Um, I like Morales here. I, I think his price tag is probably a little insane. Um, just because we haven't seen a lot on fuck it. Uh, but Morales is minus six fifty here. Fuck it is plus four thirty. I, I, I think, Maybe I, I got to look at the props and stuff that doesn't go the distance it is maybe something I'll, I'll look at here. But um, Morales has been chinned a little bit. Um, I, I like him here. I think he's a solid fighter. I don't I don't know that there's any value at minus 650 uh, outside of a, a decent prop if I find one. Uh, man, I think minus 600 is value, to be honest. Um no, I'm being like, I'm being serious. Like there's some of these guys that you're like, you know, they're priced 300, 400 and you know, we don't need to get to the whole value, whatever the fuck debate. I don't really care, but you know, I, I mean, Morales is the side here. It, it, 
if the canceled fights, a lot of times will tell you who's the side, obviously more than even the, the existing fight, right? He was supposed to fight Ramiz Brahima, who is, I think decent. Like everyone hates on Ramiz. I like Ramiz, mm -hmm. but he's a grappler. He's not a striker because I think the UFC saw what happened when he fought Giles. And, you know, I was actually there for that fight. I was third row. You know, that was the night that, uh, Vanessa fought, I do believe. So I was third row after the fight and I'm watching that fight. Like shit, man, he got chinned hard by Giles, who's, you know, an undersized, you know, he was just a small guy. He got chinned hard. And, you know, I thought to myself, like, man, Morales was really lucky that he kind of caught that fluky, weird, like uppercut that that rock Giles and then ended up putting him away. Cause I, I'm thinking, man, if he doesn't, I'm just worried about him. I'm worried about him. Cause you're right, his striking it needs a lot of work. But he's 22 years old. You know, he he's a young prospect. The UFC loves him as evidenced by the guy that they're giving him now and fuck it, who, you know, is, is left high kick and, uh, and two down the pipe. He's kind of like, uh, oh shit, where does he live? I can't remember where he lives. I was going to say like, like a, like a, uh, Eugene, he's a Eugene, Oregon, Ludovic Klein. You know what I mean? Like he throws those two, two and not very well, but he can't wrestle. You know, if, if you miss the Devin Brock fight, I think that was all you needed to see. Uh, Devin Brock is tiny. He's five foot nine. He's two inches taller than me. And this is what, 170 pounds. It just, uh, it, it wasn't a good look. Devin Brock took him down whenever he wanted and then pretty much would just fall over on his back. So, you know, I, after that, I'm like, Morales is a big, strong wrestler. He was tossing around the, uh, the Russian who I thought was actually pretty good. And I tried to fade him against the Russian. Yeah. He was tossing him around. I, I really don't worry about this spot. I think 600 is going to look like uh, like value. And maybe by the time this podcast comes out, he's going to be even more than that. So I'm going to lock a few in tonight after Contender Series. Uh, yeah, I, I like Morales here by a, by a, a mile. Okay, nice. Yeah, he, he's a solid up-and-coming kid. Um, and, and he's just going to get better and better and better. At 22 freaking years old and 13-0, and 0, I, I mean, gosh, it's... Solid, solid guy, solid fighter. I think he's going to have a big uh, upside. I think eventually he'll leave Entram and, and probably end up coming to the States. And, and you'll see some big growth, I think, once he does that. All right. What do we got next? Uh, next up, we have Drakkar Close and Rafa Garcia. Let us uh, let me hear what you, th wh what you got on this. Well, I, <laughs> I might need to be careful on this one because I don't, I don't know how long we've had the show and how many times Drakkar's fought since then. But every time I see Drakkar like in person, I'm like, dude, this guy is going to actually pull me in a back alley and kill me. I, I don't know if I've ever said something like critical of him. I said he was going to win his last fight. Um, so maybe I'm going to like skip, skip this part just a, just a tad bit. I'm just saying Rafa Garcia has been an underdog in like every fight that he's had and he always rises to the occasion. I, I think he's done really, really well for a long time. I think he's training with a great team at Elevation. I think he can wrestle his ass off. I think he's just getting going and people are overlooking him, myself included. You know, in the first fight he had against Nasrat, I was like, dude, Nasrat's going to murder this guy. This guy's fighting Combate Americas against nobodies. And he actually put on a really great performance there. He's been game in every other fight that he's had. I think Drakkar is really good too. He's big. He's aggressive. Um, uh, maybe this is two different trajectories. That's that's all I'm saying on this one. Uh, and then I'll kick it over to you. Okay, that's uh, your your silence is interesting. Um, I, mean, I don't want to get mugged in a back alley for something I don't know if I did or didn't say. Okay, I mean that makes sense. Drakkar's a lot bigger than me. Yeah, Jakar's I can fight, huge. I think, you know, he, but I, I'm not going to beat up Jakar, you know? Yeah, he's a big, durable human. Um, used to train with us for a little bit, left a little unceremoniously. Um, and he, it, it's funny because he has beaten a lot of good guys. I mean, he's got a win over Bobby Green. Um, what he does well is he's a big, strong, durable guy. He calf kicks and he pushes people to the fence. You know, he body locks, throws them. Um, really explosive, and he holds him against the fence. But, 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 we saw him open up against Benil Dariush, started throwing his hands, and then, of course, he got knocked out. And then we saw him in the Brandon Jenkins fight where he's opening up his hands a lot as well, and he got the win. I think if he opens up his hands here, he's going to lose. I think Hafa Garcia is, is the better boxer. I think he has better head movement. I think he has better fundamentals. Um, and, and I think if, if Drakkar gets in a slug fight with him, I, I think he's going to end up losing a boxing match with Hafa Garcia. The other thing is, is 
Hafa Garcia will scramble well on the mat. I mean, we'll, we'll see him get taken down and he'll come back up and he'll, he'll do a lot. Drakkar is definitely the A side here and Drakkar can win this. Uh, I think for Drakkar's easiest path to victory, it's calf kicks and clinch. But I don't know that he's going to do that. I, I, and this worries me. This is one of those, and it's one of those $200 lines or, or minus 200 lines that I always talk about being the the weird ones that you have Drakkar as being the minus 230, Hafa Garcia being plus 178. Um, I lean Drakkar here because I think he has more tools to win. I think he, not even more tools. I think if he, I think what he does really well is better than what Hafa Garcia does really well. But I don't know that he's going to stick to what he does well, and I think he's going to start brawling. I lean Drakkar close here in a decision, but if, if he starts trading, this is one of those things live bet it. If you start seeing him trading and swinging and slugging it out, bet Hafa Garcia. If you start seeing him calf kicking on the outside, clinching and pushing Garcia to the fence, then then you bet Drakkar close. This is my my only thing with Drakkar. Drakkar is good, but he wants to show you how good he is every fight. You know, we have a term for that with with us in the Discord. We call it an ape. And every time Drakkar is lost, is because he's being an ape, right? He's chasing down Benil, trying to freaking murder him, send his head into the next. You know, Brandon Jenkins is not a UFC level fighter, and you know Drakkar is just emptying the tank trying to kill this guy. And everyone's watching that fight, like, all right, if he doesn't put him out, like. Maybe Brandon Jenkins is live. You know what I mean? So I think cardio is king here. Uh, and Rafa's at the elevation. You know, he's he's at elevation fight team. I think uh, his cardio is actually really underrated. Just his skills in general. People see this five foot seven Mexican. I think this fight should be lined way closer than than where it is right now. Uh, but I, I like Jakar. I like Rafa. I think it'll be a great fight. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next up, we have another one of our, our easy plays. Um, not easy plays, but I think likes that we lock. We like Nega Morano over Poteria. And next up, we've got Dantel Mays and Hamdi uh, uh, Abdel Wahab. I don't, I don't know if that's how you say it. But anyway. I think I Abdel ate one of those in Austria. Yeah, I think you're right. I, th- I think A I had it with falafel. Uh, Hamdi is a... You're, most accomplished you love betting egyptian olympians right is that a true statement you've you've made a killing on a egyptian olympian wrestlers you i think this is your quote always bet every bankroll you have every penny on the egyptian wrestler and you will always profit is that a true statement i I don't like being teased but i I do have some breaking news if that's cool because it fits the topic i don't know if you saw i posted the i I posted the picture with hamdi and uh mahmoud uh fadi subi i I posted the picture of them together they're actually buddies obviously you know they probably wrestled in the same circuit the same team coming up uh mahmoud subi is making his return to the cage uh next week august 6th and you're gonna bet him you're gonna bet him hard of course, I have to. I have to. I have, have no to. choice but to bet the Egyptian wrestlers. Of course. Uh, tell us about this fight. Tell us about Hamdi. Tell us about Dantel. All right. Well, I'm not going to be so like so crazy like a lot of people I'm already hearing. Like, oh, fake fights and this and that. Guys, we already talked about this. Every every UFC fighter, if you dig back into their, into their early fights, they've all fought somebody who's not good. Like, that's again, part of the game, you know, it was fun. Like a few years ago when you started making that film, uh, bottom feeders, right? Like the worst guys in MMA, just who are horrible, horrible, horrible. These people exist, man. These these people are around. You have to fight some of these, these people and they're just stepping stones and you look really good. And then you go fight real people. It just is what it is. Um, They're part of the sport. I don't mean to interrupt you, but they're part of the sport. You've got to do it because you're not fighting your opponent. Your first three, four, five, ten fights, you're fighting yourself. You're fighting the nerves. You're fighting the crowd. You're trying to get comfortable. As anybody who has ever competed in anything should know, in the gym and training, you look great. All right. But now you have to do that in front of hundreds or thousands or millions of people. And that is a different freaking story. When things matter, everything changes. And you're a hundred percent right. You need these guys without those bottom feeders, without those guys who are the O and fours, you would never see the Mayweathers, the Canelos, the, the John Joneses, because you need those guys to get beat up by the good guys. So the good guys can get comfortable beating other people up. 
Well, okay. Here, here's a great example for this. Okay. Um, in Cage Warriors, they have this really, really good kid. His name's Kaolin Lauren. I, I don't know how to really say his name. Okay. His first opponent was 0 and 31. His second opponent, 0 and 39. Third opponent, 3 and 5, 0 and 0, and then 1 and 0. Okay. His last fight, he fought a guy who was 5 and 0, another big prospect. Okay. I'm looking at these fights and, uh, you know, you're, everyone's like, oh, he's a fraud. He's a fraud. He's a fraud. He's only fought guys who are 0 and 39. Like that is like as bad as you can possibly get. But if you actually watch the fights and you actually watch the film, he's actually really, really good. And he, he destroyed that guy. He looked world-class. He looked like he could go to the UFC and fight tomorrow. I mean, so guys, I'm not going to harp on this Matthew Strickland fight because there's way better film of Hamdi out there. Uh, he okay so for example we fought greg velasco in cffc that is a great piece of film because greg velasco is a d1 wrestler you know not a great d1 wrestler at that but he's a d1 wrestler he's a tough guy cffc loves him okay split decision so we got to see a little bit on both sides now what hamdi does well he swings bombs right He's got very short arms. He's a very short guy. He swings bombs. Now, they're not technical at all, but I'm sure if they hit, they hurt because Velasco was getting tagged and running away and noticeably damaged and noticeably hurt. Pretty much everybody else he's put away, right? He's got a first round stoppage, all his other fights first round, and then Dustin Clements injured his leg. I remember not being super impressed in that fight. Um, he's just short. He gasses himself a little bit by swinging so freaking hard. He just doesn't understand how to fight yet. You know, I, I don't believe the Egyptian wrestler thing pretty much at all. Not that he's not an Egyptian Olympic wrestler, but in MMA, it's just so different, right? Uh, on the other side of things, you look at Dante Mays. Now, Dante Mays has lost a few fights What he's two and two in the UFC. Um, he's part of the, the Jackson wink boys, right? You got Christian Edwards, you got Davion Franklin, you got a lot of guys down there and, you know, say what you want about Davion, but they're athletic, they're big, they're strong, and they can all wrestle. I love that. Um, you know, if you really look at Don tail at heavyweight, we've talked about this forever. Athleticism goes a very long way. Physically, Don tail maze is so fast and so athletic. He really does have the, have the, the tools, the physical tools to be a top five UFC fighter, like at heavyweight no doubt to me. He strikes well. He went rounds with Cyril gone. Like I really like Dante Mays. Um, you know, on short notice UFC on a pay-per-view, the jitters, all the feelings, all the things involved. I like Dante Mays here. I actually really like his striking. I think he's fast and dynamic. I think he can take down Hamdi, uh, if need be. And I think that would actually be a really wise thing. I mean, he just moves so freaking well, you know, he's going to get in on the body lock, get on the takedowns and use pure athleticism to, to take down Hamdi. Um, I, I like Don till Mays. I have a pretty, pretty large wager here and I got it in decently early. So I'm looking for a good hedge hedge spot when people, you know, start hearing, Oh, fake fights, fake fights. They're not fake fights. They're real fights. They actually happen just because it happened on a 40 year old that looks like a pair. That's beside the point. The fights actually happen, but run with whatever narrative. It's going to give me a good hedge out spot for some free money. I like it. I like it. Don't tell his athletic. He's getting better. You, you see him talking about cardio too. He said, well, you know, early in my career, cardio was an issue. And now he started to really push on cardio and started really like focusing training to be a fighter. And he's got a wonderful jab. He, like you said, he is athletic. He is fast. And you do not see a lot of really fast heavyweights. Well, Don Tell me is, is a fast freaking heavyweight. You know, on the other side of that, Hamdi is not – I mean, he's a powerful guy. He's a big, strong, powerful guy. He looks like Van Lee Silva in his prime when he's swinging. It is a left hook and a right hook, chin up, running at you just like – just big swings. And so of course he's going to hurt a lot of people with doing that. One thing that was really telling with, with Hamdi was that he's not getting these great Greco throws and he's a Greco Olympian. He's shooting in on people and lifting them up and dumping them almost like, you know, just, just some power lifter bodybuilder guy who's fighting MMA, just shooting in, tackling them, lifting them up. Hey, just really quick question. Does Mark Madsen, does he do more Greco takedowns or does he do more uh, double legs? Well, it's funny. Mark Madsen, when he, gosh, when he grabs you, first of all, you can't get away from him. His upper body control is insane. But what he does a lot of the time is he will shoot 
on the legs and then come up upper body to control. Yeah. Um, and, and, or he'll punch his way into the clinch and he finds himself with an underhook. But he underhooks differently, high-level Greco guys. And we're talking about Mark Madsen, an Olympic silver medalist, a multiple-time world champion. Like, he's a legit Greco guy. I mean, you see that his underhooks, he's not grabbing a shoulder on an underhook. It's almost like mid-back, like shoulder blade type stuff. He's bumping on the inside with the knees. His leverage points are so different. Um, but he's, again, he's shooting legs and then coming up or punching his way into the clinch. Hamdi is just like punching his way into shots and then trying to lift on the shots. Like I haven't seen a lot of high level Greco stuff from him. Um, and, and then I think like you said it, the nerves, the adrenaline, the crowd, uh, I, I think he's going to go in guns blazing and, and just swinging and shooting and trying to get down tell down. And then round two starts if it starts. And then man, I think it is going to be all downhill from there. If he can get out of round one, God bless him, and bet heavy on Dantel when when you look at uh, Hamdi in the corner sucking air. I just, uh, you know, okay, bare knuckle is probably one of my favorite things, right? Now. I love bare knuckle, but I would never do it. I would never do bare knuckle. Like that, my, you know, I'd have to be desperate, real desperate just to make ends meet to be doing bare knuckle. And even then, I probably wouldn't. Hamdi started his his pro career with bare knuckle. That's just a very weird move for a top prospect, right? I mean, it's not like Conor McGregor was offered a, a, a super large, you know, or I mean, I guess who's a good prospect like Ian Gary, was he offered a super large bare knuckle contract? No, he went right to fighting because people saw this promise and this thing. So it just makes you wonder like, what was the trajectory of, of Hamdi, right? He allegedly, he trains with, uh, the, the Daniel Gracie guys, you know, he's Henzo Gracie Philly, but he's actually with uh, David Branch, right? So he's not necessarily with all the guys, you know, Sean Brady, Sabatini. But how did he get linked up with with Masvidal and he's fighting in the bare knuckle league? That's just a weird transition for a guy who's a blue chip prospect, if he is a blue chip prospect, right? An Olympian. So I don't know. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I like Dantel here. I like Dantel here. I think he's solid. And I think we're going to see a lot more out of Dantel um, in the future. I think I think he's getting better. And I think uh, I, I think we're going to start to see him fighting much better people, doing much better just as, as a whole. He's supposed to fight Justin Taffa. Taffa pulled out. And, and that's why we're getting um, Hamdi on this. All right. What do we got next? Drew Dober uh, next and up we've Rafael got Drew Alves. Do- Yes, man. Uh, I mean, I mean, Alves is, it's funny. Everybody likes to harp on Alves in terms of like boom or bust. Cause he comes out and he is swinging for the fences like a madman. I mean, he's batshit right off, right off the gun. And then he definitely slows down, but his cardio is not as bad as a lot of people make it out to be like, Oh man, you get through the first couple goes and, and, and you know, he's, he's all downhill. Yeah, I'm pulling up his record now. He's actually really tough still. He's 20 and 10. Um, Dober's 24 and 11. But Rafael Alves is 31. He's not a huge guy. He's 5'8", but so is Dober. He's got that guillotine over Diakasi. Uh, and, and that was impressive because he actually hit him with that knee. Uh, I think it was a knee. Rocked him and then and then choked him out. And then his fight with, uh, I mean, he's got a, a decision loss against Demir is Magulov, who we have seen is, gosh, he is one he's of the, the best yep. in the business right now. God, it, he's just good everywhere. Um, and, and But you, you should know what you're getting with Rafael Alves. And, and he comes out right out of the gate, but he actually measures, he kind of almost knows like, he's all blitz and then he does nothing almost kind of reminds reminds me of like uh, Hector Lombard or um, Yoel Romero just swinging for the fences. And then they know not to do a lot and move and be slow and recover and then swing for the fences and recover. And I mean, Alves, his, his striking is decent I mean, he's not bad. He, he does too many dumb spinning, jumping shit, you know, but other than that, I mean, his, his kicks are good. He's decent. He is very serviceable. His wrestling is pretty weak, but man, he's got a guillotine for days. And if you give him your neck, he is going to take the guillotine. You know, and then the, on the other side of that, we have Drew Dober, who is fucking good, man. Drew Dober is good. He's got some losses on his record. Um, 
lost to Brad Rydell in a really good fight, and he lost to Islam Machkov. I mean, he beat Paulo Reyes, he beat Nasrat, uh, beat Alex Hernandez, beat Terrence McKinney. And, and, and man, that Terrence McKinney fight was so freaking impressive that he got rocked, recovered, did the right stuff. Got rocked again, recovered, did the right stuff. I think he might even been taking a kick to the head while his hand was still on the ground as he was coming up. You know, ate it, got back up, kept the pressure going. I mean, he does all of the right stuff. His stand-up is great. His defensive wrestling is really solid. Uh, you don't really see him offensively wrestling, which which I think is going to be really good. The only, I think the only way that Alves wins this is by guillotine. And, and by some weird scramble, you know, we see um, Dober shoot. He can absolutely get guillotined. If he doesn't shoot and get guillotined, I don't see how he loses this fight. I love Dober here. I love him in the spot. I love him at uh, minus 210. Uh, man, give me give me Dober at minus 310, and, and I would still bet him here. Wow. Man, that's that's tough because I man, I think Rafael Alves is actually really freaking good, man. I think he's uh, super physical and everything is dramatic with him. I mean, it's just dramatic with him. I, I'm with you on Dober. I mean, he's what st- scientifically proven to have like the hardest and best, like a hardest head and best chin in the entire UFC. Like it's incredible. This guy, um, all the skills in the world. I mean, he he's an awesome guy to watch, but. Man, his style is going to have to lead him into the uh, to the lion's den. That is Rafael Alves, right? For him to win and have this A side, I mean, he's going to be in striking range. He's going to be right there for Alves. That's tough. It's tough. You know, logic tells me that it's going to be Dober, right? I think you know better cardio. He just makes all the right decisions and he checks pretty much every box that you want, especially somebody that you're fighting for or uh, betting on. But Man, this is just like for me, Ludovic and uh, Mason last week. I think I said this on the show, and I know for sure I said this in the Discord, but I had a bad dream about Mason. Like I was like, dude, I have a bad dream about Mason. Every time I have a bad dream, they always lose. So as much as I love Mason Jones, I couldn't put him on my love him, my love him picks. I didn't hammer him. I actually didn't even have him in long shot parlays. I just got rid of Mason pretty much altogether. I put him on light because in theory, I thought he should win, right? Cardio and size and range and all that stuff. I just had a bad feeling about it. And and this one to me is that, that bad feeling. I just, you know, people doubt Alves all the time and he pulls stuff from everywhere. He's so explosive and so dynamic. You know, the, the guys that Dober just beat, you know, Polo Reyes and Terrence McKinney, who's, you know, pretty much a one round guy. And I said that his style is not sustainable. Well, Alves, but, you know, decision with the mirror, you know, dis- he's got decisions. He hits so freaking hard. He's got great submissions. Like he is just an ultra veteran of the game. So huh, I want to pick Dober, um, but this would be, this would be one of the upset, uh, you know, the dog watches for me as Alves in the spot. I mean, I've seen crazier picks, crazier upsets, um, you know, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a surprise. I just I don't think without a guillotine that he can beat Dober. I think Dober is just too clean standing. I think he's physical. I think his wrestling is good. I think all of his fundamentals are good. You know, I think he trains with a good team. I think that it's what we're saying about Maquan. It's what we're saying about guys last week on the card, Paul Craig. They have to do something. Um, they have to get they, that. They one have thing. to yes. Um, you know, and and Alves has got to get that guillotine. And and you want know what was really impressive to me is that Dober Dober got out of the Machikov armbar. I mean, he defended that. I mean, Machikov had an armbar. He wiggled, he moved, he turned, he did the right stuff. Uh, It's not like he, you know, he got in a round two with it. And it's not like he just got taken down and was just a fish on his back. Like, he had no idea what to do. He knows what he's he's doing. I'm not doubting that. I just, you you got to stand there and trade with a guy that's as dynamic as Alves. I mean, that's that's just a tough ask any time. I disagree with that. I think Elvis has got to stand and trade with a guy as dynamic and as good as Drew Dober. And I think Drew Dober is just so much better on a technical level than Elvis uh, that that I think Elvis is going to be the one who, you know, it's almost like Demir. He's got to, Demir was so clean that Elvis ha- had to do stuff and had to shoot and had to like, 
you know, kind of get wild because I, again, I think that's how he's going to have to win. The but difference Amir can play Dober. power forward in the NBA. He's huge, and Drew Dober is the same height as him. Yeah, but Drew Dober comes to play, and Drew Dober is going to be swinging for the fences and blasting leg kicks. Um, whereas Demir is like, I'm an out point. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that when people get knocked out though, is when they're trying to kill people. I mean, IE oh. John Dodson and Nathaniel Wood, right. He went to go put it on him and then got put out. Right. That's when well, they that's, get knocked that's out. How- that's how it is with everything. I mean, it, you, you got to risk it to get it. If you're playing for points, you're not, not going to knock people out. It, it's risk reward. I mean, it's, it's that, that's it. Do you think Dober Drew, can finish want- him? Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. So do you think, think fight Dober doesn't go would be him. a good spot here? Um, I don't know. And the only reason I say I don't know is both these guys are actually pretty durable. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, I think he can put him out. I think he can hurt him. I don't know if he will. Because again, I, I think if the fight is finished, I think it's Alves gets a guillotine. Um, you know what would be a really good set here? Uh, Dober decision with a finish is no bet. That, I think, covers all your bases. I think that's it. I think that's a solid bet. I think that's a solid bet here. Um, I, I like Dober. I, I really do, man. I, I like Dober. And, and again, if you look at who he's lost to, he lost to Brad Rydell, top five in the division, Brad Rydell, and Islam Machkov, who's fighting for the title. Um, and, and he's lost to Benny Dariush. And actually, that was a bad fight IQ moment for him. He was beating yeah. Benil's ass and then he <laughs> took Benil down and got submitted. Like that was bad fight oh, IQ. It I, broke my I, heart. I don't think, and I love Benny. Oh, right. I don't think we're going to see that again. And, and I think we've got a really solid, <clears throat> I, I think Drew Dober was a little sloppy in his early UFC tenure. Um, Sean Spencer, Nick Hine, Efren Escadero, he lost to all of those guys. He beat Jamie Varner by rear naked choke. Um, and then he started like just getting better. He beat Holtzman. He beat Jason Gonzalez. He beat Josh Berkman, Frank Camacho, John Tuck. Um, and then Nasrat and, and then Alex Hernandez. I mean, Alex Hernandez is a very fast and dynamic athletic guy. And Drew Dober just, man, he, he, he it was a walk. Dober's got the goods. I, like I'm not doubting anything with Dober. He's got the goods. He, he really is that good. Just a weird feeling. And everybody can dismiss it if they want to. I, I like Dober. That will be my pick technically because I think he is better, but it just worries yeah. me. I don't know. All right, man. I, I get that. I get that because Rafael is definitely one of those guys who is dangerous and, and c- who can hurt somebody. And uh, next up, we got Alex Morono and Matt Samelisberger. Um, what are the odds here? Because I'm assuming it's probably something similar to what we had before. Um, ah, Samelisberger is minus 170. Morono is plus 140. What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Oh, that's that's actually really interesting. I actually thought it would be the opposite. Every time Morono fights, he's always got so much love towards him. Everybody loves Morono. It's really, uh, and you know, he's an ultra veteran. He's been around a long time. I, I think this is going to be the fight that I was hoping that the Mickey Gall fight would be. I think Semmelsberger is game. I, I hope he's going to be in his face. I hope he's going to hit hard, stay right there, and have the cardio to last hopefully the the counter wrestling to last not that morono's got great wrestling to to begin with um or great striking i I don't want to spend too much time on this one i didn't get to study this one as much as i would like and i probably will have to dive a little bit deeper this week um i I think i like semelsberger here i think this is going to end up being a really good spot i think the younger faster just kind of up and coming guy versus like the the more guy you know the guy who's more of a coach and wants to teach some stuff and show some stuff is a little loopy and wide and, and unathletic. I, I like Semmelsberger here. I'm with you a thousand percent. Um, you know, Semmelsberger's defensive wrestling is not phenomenal, but you said it, Alex Morono's offensive wrestling is not phenomenal. And Semmelsberger will, I mean, we saw it in one of his last fights, I think it was CFFC, where he got taken down and he got held on the ground for, you know, a little bit the rest of the round. But then after that, man, he got taken down and was scrambling and wiggling and going and would not do it. I think that was His, Big Zulk, who was actually a really good wrestler. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, it was. Samuelsberger's striking is really, really solid. Um, he has a one-two right down the middle, and his straight is just unbelievable. He has good body work. 
his hands are high. He brings his hands back up to his face. We saw it with the Chaos Williams fight. I think he was tentative because Chaos Williams' power. And then the other thing that Chaos Williams did was, man, he, Williams was firing off three, four, five punch combos in a row. And, and Semmelsberger had to keep a high guard, it, and it was really hard for him to get offense. But he did land some good shots, and he did have have a lot of good work in that fight. I, I, you know, Morono is so square with his stance. He's so wide with that left hand. His check hook is so clunky and telling but what what he does do is when he throws man that dude throws with power he throws to hurt um and, and he does he throws these weird awkward punches where he'll kind of find him in these little moments that it's not a punch it's not is it a cross or an uppercut or I, I don't know it's just like he's throwing a weird awkward angle punch up there because he's down to fight um again good cardio i i think morono's only path to victory is to be able to like grind Semmelsberger out in a either push him against a fence or, or drag the takedowns. I don't see him doing that or trying to do that. I see him trying to strike and I see him getting absolutely picked apart standing for his efforts. All right. So it's finally time. Sorry, Mickey Gall. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really like Semmelsberger. I really like his striking. I don't think he's ever going to be a world beater. I don't think, I don't even know if he'll, he'll break the top 10 only because he doesn't seem to really have the power to put people away. And, and he is, I mean, he does, don't get me wrong. Like he's got a couple, uh, I mean, he knocked out Jason Witt in 16 seconds, but that's Jason Witt. Um, and he knocked out and, Sano. Very yes, good. He did. He did. Um, but he has got, like he is landing some really amazing solid punches and, and guys are eating it. Like, I, I don't know that it's really hurting some people. And so he, he does have power, but it's not like touch of death, Derek Lewis power. And then he doesn't have the defensive wrestling that he needs at the upper echelon of that division. So I love his striking. I love his fight. I love his, his basics. I love his fundamentals. I think defensive wrestling is is where he's going to have some trouble once once he starts climbing the ranks. But I, I think he's going to get by Morono here. All right. Next up, we got Magomed Ankalaev and Anthony Smith. Oh, is this me or is this you? Go ahead. Um, this is one minus five seventy for Ankalaev and uh, plus three ninety for Anthony Smith, and I am. I feel like I'm pretty critical of Anthony Smith because he gets taken down Don't do it. And, and he doesn't get back up. Like he just doesn't get back up, but he's a lot better than I criticize. He beat Ryan Spann. He beat Jimmy Crute. He beat Devin Clark. He lost to Ratchik and, and Glover Teixeira. Um, he beat Alex Gustafson. He beat Ozdemir, Shogun, Rashad. His only losses since 2018 are Tiago Santos, John Jones, Glover Teixeira, and Alexander Ratchich. Um, you know, and then on the other side of that, we have Ankalaev, who's 17 and one, who got triangle by Paul Craig, actually. Um, beat Dolce, beat Kutilava, beat Nikita Kirilov, beat Ozdemir, and beat Tiago Santos. Um, so I'm just going through that because these odds are just a little bit crazy to me. Um, I, I know we love our Russians. I just think the odds themselves are a little crazy. Uh, I Ankalaev, what, what I can't get, what worries me about Ankalaev is watching Paul Craig take him down. Um, in in you know before he triangled him, he you know he shot in. Ankalaev kind of grabbed the neck, and Paul Craig just trip take down. You know, got a trip takedown that was so JV. I mean, we, we saw Paul Craig against Ozdemir the other night who couldn't do anything. Um, man, and, and, and I like Ankalaev striking, but it's not... Um, the thing that worries me about Ankalaev striking is the volume. I wish he had more volume, especially against Santos. Um, and he got clipped by Santos. He got clipped by Santos and he got sat down. Um, Anthony Smith is a big, strong guy. Um, he... he He's he's a dog, man. He is a dog. He is a dog. He is a dog. Um, I I I lean on Kalev here. I don't I don't think Anthony Smith is going to get the the big upset. I I don't want to bet it though because 
not even at the price tag. I don't even care if Uncle Ive was was a dog or a Smith or what or or you know like really what it is. I I just there's something about Uncle Ive that I'm not sold on when when he's fighting just a dog of a fighter. And, and I think Anthony Smith is one of those guys that can. Um, and, and if Uncle Ive was a wrestler. If Uncle Ive was a guy who's going to shoot in and take people down and ratchet uh, Anthony Smith, I would bet Uncle Ive, to, you know, regard he could be minus 10,000, I would bet him. Because Anthony Smith doesn't get back up. He gets taken down and that is it. But man, Uncle Ive is just, he is a striking Russian. And he's got good striking. He's got a touch of death. Um, you know, but man, I, I just, I worry about a brawl with him. I worry about seeing Paul Craig take him down. And, and for for as much as I've I've been critical of Anthony Smith in the past, he legitimately has good jujitsu. And if he drops on Kalaev and jumps on him and turns this into some sort of a jujitsu match from on top, if if Anthony Smith is on top of Ankalaev, that's a bad situation for Ankalaev. And I think I've seen crazier things happen. Like I said, I. I I mean, I, I think Uncle Ive gets the win, but man, I, I don't like this bet. Um, you know, I'm going to stay away from that one. Hmm. I, man, Anthony Smith's been losing me so much money over the past. Like, he just is killing me. Out of everybody, he's probably the number one guy. I remember I, I always tell this story, like, when I first started this, you know, about a year ago, and I had built a nice little bankroll. I think I had like ten thousand in the account. I was so pumped. I, you know, I went to uh, to Florida with UFC Shark, and I was like, "All right, Jimmy Crute, that's my man. Jimmy Crute, that's my man." Put half my bankroll on uh, on Jimmy Crute, and then uh, Anthony Smith leg kicked him, and you know, until his leg didn't work anymore. So Anthony Smith has been the bane of my my betting existence. Nice enough guy, everything like this. Uh, I think Uncle Liev pieces him apart. I think he offensively wrestles. I mean, if he's got any any semblance of, of brain cells, he front kicks him and then takes him down the second that he gets close. Um, I think the read on, on um, Anthony Smith is still correct. I think he's got bad cardio. We, we've seen him get really, really tired in a lot of fights, and especially if he has to grapple and he doesn't get the submission, right? If he gets punched in the face over and over and over again. Um, you know, So finding a way to play this is tricky. Because he is an ultra veteran, so is Uncle Live going to finish him in a three round fight? I don't know. Uh, finding a you, you, to only make value with this, you'd have to parlay it, obviously. Um, and maybe you're right. the The line is a little bit wide, but I do like Uncle Live. I think he goes for takedowns. I think pretty pretty easy decision. You know, a pretty easy uh, easy pick here is Uncle Live. Man, if I could guarantee that Uncle Live would wrestle, I would pick him in a heartbeat. I'll call um, him. I'll let him know. Let him know. I mean, did we see him shoot at all against Santos? No, but I think that was a kind of a rare one-off. Yeah, I mean, we just, I, I don't know. I just, I don't, uh, I, I like him. I think he's very good. Um, I, I think if he stays standing with Anthony Smith for too long, he's going to get clipped and, um, Man, I, it, again, like I said, Uncle Ive should win here. I just don't want to bet money on it. Um, th- there's not; it, it's too wide of a spread, um, and, and there's it's just a weird, risky thing. And Anthony Smith is just one of those guys that won't die. He won't freaking die, and, and he's beaten people who are so much better than him. He's made a career of beating people better than him. And, and if you look at his losses, I mean, like let's look at his losses. He's thirty six and sixteen. Um, a lot of those losses were early in his career where you could tell he was not training with good people at all. From 2010 down to 20, when he started, he turned pro in 2008. Between 08 and, and 2010, he has one, two, three, four, five, six losses. Um, you know, so if you take those away, I mean, he's still 36 in, in 10. Um, uh, again, give me the guy who's 17 and one. That's the play here. That's the Dag Russian seventeen and one guy. We're, we need um, to go out I, on I our just, shields about this uh, minus five sixty favorite. We really need to make a yeah. case and tell people how smart we are. Man, um, I don't know. I just Uncle Live should win. You guys, just I, I don't know that it's worth putting money on. So if you do put money on him, you have to put so much on to win. 
And if you do put that much money on and you lose, like, ugh, I don't know. You're I don't see value upset. in it. I don't like it. Yeah. All righty. What do we got next? Alexandre Pantoja versus Alex Perez. Um, Man, I, t- I, I watched a little bit of tape on this, but didn't we do this a few... No, this was with Cards ago. Nell and Alex Perez. Oh, okay, okay, that's right. Because we looked. That's right. Because that was supposed to happen two or three times. A couple times. I just kept yeah. seeing that damn thing again and again and again and again. Um, man, I I did not watch a lot of tape on this. I'll watch some more tape and and throw my thoughts up on the on the Patreon so you guys really have a, a solid read on this. Um, I love me some Pantoja. Um, you know, he's. Well, we need to give the disclaimer. We need to give the disclaimer. What's he's that, been out he to train. With us he's for, been out to train with us. Yeah. For like four days. Like, <laughs> yeah, he, he's come and trained with us before. Oh my gosh. Disclaimer. Um, Pantoja is a favorite here. Um, I think he should be the favorite. I think Perez is, is good. I think he's tough. He has a really good low kick. Um, he swings hard, covers up, shells up. Um, man, I just think Pantoja is just really freaking good. Um, and, and the thing with this, this Pantoja fight is, uh, I'm pulling up right now, Perez's record. Um, he's got the leg kick win over, uh, Formiga. He's got a submission over Espinosa. I mean, a decision over De La Rosa. Um, you know, he's not fighting really high level guys. If you look at his record in the UFC, um, Kevin Gray, Carl's D, Carl's John D. Tomas, Eric Shelton, Jose Short, Shorty Torres, who's not there anymore, lost to Benavides, um, Mark De La Torre, Jordan Espinosa, Jussier Formiga. And Formiga's a solid name. He lost to Figueredo, lost to Benavides. Um, I, I think he's coming up short against the top guys. And I look at Pantoja as one of those top guys. He can wrestle his ass off. His jujitsu is phenomenal. His jujitsu is really, really good. Oh. Um, he can take a punch. He has good cardio. He's crowding people. His thing is he has a ha, has a hard time. He had a hard time with Askar Askarov, um, who could out wrestle him, and and Figueredo, who's freaking Figueredo. I, I like Pantoja here. I, I think he is. I, I, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised to see him get the finish. Yeah, I, I'm with you. You know, we have a little personal history with Pantoja. Pantoja came uh, came to camp when I was really, really young in my my career. I think I only had three amateur fights or whatever, um, and I got a, I got to work with Pantoja a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I've never hit somebody so hard in my entire life, and then look at me and just okay, that's what you got, and then just keep coming forward. And and honestly, you, you watch his fights; that's how he fights. You can hit him with. Wait, sorry, I, I have to interrupt you. I have to interrupt you. Sorry, he has the same. I don't care about getting hit look on his face that, um, um, oh my gosh, who's the Bellator? Uh, he just lost to Eblin. Uh, oh, gay guard. <laughs> gay guard. Yes. They like the lip sticking out, just like you punch him in the face and he's like, eh, I don't really care about that. That's what Pantoja does. He just has this look on his face that he just doesn't care. And I don't think he's ever brushed his hair in his life. Just like gay guard. And I'm not He's sure like Che Guevara. They... I love it. <laughs> yeah. He just doesn't care, man. Sorry. Keep going. I just had to go. On. No, he, he looks like Che Guevara. I, I love him. He's just like a like a like a little rebel. I, I hit him I, to this day, I don't think I've ever hit somebody as hard as I hit Pantoja. And he just like looked both ways. Like, did he fucking hit me like this? And just came and fucking chased me down. Uh, and then I got to spar, you know, spar, do some cage rounds with him. And I remember he like kind of let me take him down. He's like, ah, that's cute. And he arm barred me and, you know, we had rolled and trained together and he knew I was high level jujitsu. I have only been arm barred by two people in, you know, years, at least in no gi or MMA. And one is you and one is Pantoja. I mean, Pantoja's jujitsu is legitimately excellent. You know, watching him do rounds with Henry, Henry couldn't really pin that guy down. He's just so squirmy and so good. Every like Henry Cejudo would take him down and couldn't pin him. Like, come here, man. Stop moving. Um, you know, honestly, I think that's probably what happens here. I think, uh, I think Perez is going to watch the Askar Askarov fight and say, all right, game plan is to wrestle because I think his shots are too loopy to, uh, to catch Pantoja clean. So I think the read is going to end up being wrestling, which I think will work the opposite of what Perez hopes it's going to do. I think that's going to tire out Perez. 
And I think that's going to keep Pantoja fresh. Pantoja keeps a high pace. He's kind of one of those guys that's like, I'm going to tire myself out, but you're going to die with me. And I'm game to stay here and, and beat your ass. Um, you're right. I think he is, he's one of those top guys. I, I think Perez is very good. I was actually really surprised with the, the press tape. He's a lot better than I remember, but, um, I, I like Pantoja here, Homer or not. I really like Pantoja. I think he's got all the goods. Um, so that's going to be the pick. Yeah. It's funny. You talked about uh, Perez's wrestling. I think Perez will wrestle. I think you're right on that. But the difference though is he has kind of, kind of an American style wrestling, which is not as good as the, I think the Dagestani style wrestling for MMA yet. We're starting to see better Americans. We saw, um, gosh, who just beat, uh, I, I I'm tired you guys. I, I've been on a plane. I'm, I'm jet lagged. Um, who did, who just beat, um, uh, Leandro in Bellator, the Italian kid. Oh, <laughs> um, Danny Sabatello. Yeah, Sabatello. I was thinking Sabatini, but it was yeah, Sabatello. He they're in, the in same ATT, to me, guys. So ATT, they're doing something different, you guys. They're actually wrestling out in the open, and instead of running people to the cage and trying to get the takedown and then people getting back up, um, Sabatello is cutting corners out in the open, keeping people out in the open, and doing some. The ATT guys are doing some really good open mat wrestling and avoiding the fence, and they're controlling people in the middle of the cage, which is phenomenal. Um, the dags will push people to the cage and like Askar Askarov, he will shoot and he wraps up the way that they grip their single legs is different. They, they do this like weird hugging tie, whereas Americans grab our own hands. And so the space is different and, and they wrap things up and we'll go backside double and come up of course, and go, go into body locks and stuff like that. And that works well against the cage. But Perez is an American style wrestler who's going to be shooting singles and doubles and pushing to the cage. And that is not going to be as successful as if you're shooting singles and doubles and cutting corners out in the open. But I don't think he's as good, uh, you know, in, in that area to do that. Pantoja's at ATT. He's got a plethora of dag riders over there. And he's got these high level guys who are, are really. Do, just doing amazing things with out in the open wrestling these days. I, I think he's going to have just such high level wrestlers to go against that. I, I just, I cannot see him being out wrestled by Perez here in this spot. Just high level fighters in general. Yeah. The thing about Alex Perez too, is like, can we, we kind of talk about like the state of LA, like Los Angeles, like training there. You have to go to yeah. nine different gyms to get yeah. MMA. Basically you go one boxing gym, one Muay Thai gym, jujitsu, wrestling all at separate places. I think Alex is one of those guys that kind of bounces around a million different places. So how many good training partners does he have? And then how many good 125 world-class training partners does he have where Pantoja has literally every guy in the world. He's got Horiguchi, he's got 9,000 other little tiny guys, the kid that's the champion in one, like you, you have so many people. So yeah, I think, I think Pantoja is the side here. And at minus 174, that, that's a solid... That's a solid money bet. I got him a lot. Or I got him 155, which I'm happy nice. with. Nice. All right. Next up, we have Derek Lewis um, and Sergey Pavlovich. Tell me your thoughts on that. I really like this. <laughs> really like this fight, man. I, uh, I I can't believe Pav was you know opened up as a such a huge dog. Like everyone has this like weird affliction for Derek Lewis, and I don't really understand it because he's not necessarily a minute winner. He loses every round of every fight until he doesn't. Uh, and Pavlovich is solid. Like people say he's so stiff and you're right. He is stiff, but he's kind of fundamental. Like he moves forward. He throws a clean one, two. He looks stiff as hell, but he he's good defensive wrestler. Um, he fights a style in which is not going to tire himself out. I mean, I, we've talked about this a lot, like just, uh, the style in which Derek Lewis fights is not favorable for the judges back foot backed up against the cage, you know, defending, you know, just trying not to get hit is not favorable for the judges. Now, if you think that Derek Lewis could come nuke, uh, Sergey Pavlovich, then you could play great, you know, a great idea to play would be, uh, Pavlovich decision finish. No bet. I think that's pretty safe, but I really like a Pavlovich money line. I think that, uh, he hits hard. He's, he's, Man, he's big, he's strong, he's physical. Good counter wrestling, good power in his hands, good fundamentals. I like Pavlovich a lot here. Uh, that's my pick, and I'm probably going to play him pretty, pretty decent. Man, I if this was two years ago, I would go Derek Lewis easy. 
um, Pavlovich is not fast. He's not like a, a very fast he's heavyweight. He kind of stands there. He's very slow. He doesn't do a lot that's going to score points outside of when he blitzes. Like, you know, when he, when he crowds and blitzes, but then he opens himself up and he'll do this a lot. He's narrow almost in a boxing stance, but when he starts really blitzing, he gets square and he starts rushing in. And that is what Derek Lewis made a living on, ducking down, almost like what we saw with the Cody Garbrandt um, knockout of um, a Sun Tzu, where he kind of ducked off to the side. Uh, a Sun Tzu came in and boom, hit him, hit him with that big overhand. Derek Lewis has made a living off of that. I, I, I think he's going to do that here, um, but I don't think he's going to finish Pavlovich with it. And... I think Pavel, I, I think Derek Lewis is, uh, you know, man, I, I just don't think his he has the fight left in him. I, I think we've seen he's got the best a Lamborghini of Derek now. Lewis. Yep, I I, th- I think he's on the decline. Um, Derek Lewis is actually a little bit of a dog here. I think he's plus one ten. Um, now he is. He didn't used to be. Oh, he didn't start at it. No, I, um, man, I'm not big on Pavlovich I, I, as a whole. I don't think he's bad. I, I just am not like he doesn't wow me anywhere. Like he's durable. He's good. Um, but he's not dynamic. He's not overly a volume guy. It's, he's not some amazing technician. So it's like, he, he's fine everywhere, but I, I think he's just going to eventually swarm, uh, Derek Lewis and, and man, Derek Lewis is one of those guys that can freaking put anybody out at any point. So, you know, I mean, I mean, we saw with Volkov, Volkov was what, 10 seconds away from getting a win over Derek Lewis. And then, Derek Lewis, Derek Lewis. So, I mean, is this a sharp sure thing? No, man. Derek Lewis is, I, I mean, Curtis Blades is is infinitely a better fighter than Derek Lewis all around. And Derek Lewis didn't care. He's like, yeah, I'm going to knock you out. And one of the most brutal knockouts anyone's ever going to see. Um, I don't think he's going to do that to Pavlovich here. Uh, I, I think eventually, he, man, I, I think he could win a decision just from volume in the, in the blitzes. Cause Derek is very inactive. He knows you talk about this all the time, guys with bad cardio who know how to fight with bad cardio. He, he does nothing. He does those kicks. He moves away and draws people in. And then when they come in and blitz, then he swings and knocks them out. I mean, he's he, like, that's, that's his MO. Um, but man, so, so he's not going to out volume anybody. And, and really, I mean, at this point, years ago, I mean, he, he was a boomer bust type of guy and we always knew that, but you could count on him once that athleticism and that chin goes away for guys like this. And then a little bit of fight, uh, then, then I think, I think he's going to hit, hit the skids. And and I think we're going to start to see Derek Lewis losing a few more fights and, and then probably hanging them up. And, and I think Pavlovich is going to, going to get the win here. Could probably this by weekend. decision. Who knows? Yes, it could be. Um, but he's 30 years old. Um, he's 6'3". He has an 84-inch reach. I mean, What about his arms? So, what... <laughs> um, I, I mean, again, I, I think he's a big, strong dude who's probably going to be okay finding his way in. Um, don't go crazy, you guys, because, uh, again, Derek Lewis is a, a scary guy to bet against because he can always finish that fight with a, a, at any point. But, man, I like Pavlovich here. I'm going to go crazy. I think I like that spot. I'm going to go crazy. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't say don't go crazy. I would say don't have a guy like that as the anchor in all of your parlays. But you guys should never be anchoring the same guy in all your parlays anyway. But you see that. You see people who are like, oh, I Pavlovich wins, and they have five different parlays, and Pavlovich in all of the parlays. Like, don't do that. Like, throw a parlay. Throw a good parlay. Except for Billy Elikana. <laughs> Except for Billy Alakina. Um, yeah, so I, I think he's a better play here, especially later in later in the years of um, uh, Derek Lewis. All right, we are co main time. We are tired. Co- it is like May, it's like midnight almost. Traveling, too jet late. lagged. Yeah. All right. We got Brandon late. Moreno and Kai Cara France. Go ahead. Kick uh, this one this off. is a this is a really weird one to me. I watched a lot of tape on this. I probably watched more tape on this than I did any other fight. Brandon Moreno is minus 220. Kai Kara is plus 174. Um, 
man, and, and both these guys are really good. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about Moreno just, just off the top of our heads and stuff. And I was watching him, let me pull up his record. Cause I was watching a, a few fights before I watched, um, his Brandon Royval fight, his Formiga fight, and then the first Kaikara France fight. Uh, and he really, he has that weird, awkward stance and he's like frumpy and his chin's out and, and he opens his hands up all the time. Like what, what, what hit me? So awkward. And, uh, in his last Figueredo fight, he, he was, he tightened up. I mean, it's still awkward, still a little weird, still, you know, but it wasn't as weird and awkward and clunky as I remember it being. Um, I, I think his best punch is, is a jab. Um, he really has a really good jab and, and he's long. He's really, what is his, what do they have his reach at? Um, he has a 70 inch reach. Kaikara France has a 66 and a half inch reach. Um, and he's uh France is uh five four and Moreno is five seven, but man, it almost looks like Moreno's five nine and Kai Kara's like five one. You watch those two next to each other. I mean Moreno can scramble, he can take the back, his wrestling's not phenomenal, but man, the dude has dog in him. There's that. On the other side you have Kai Kara France, who I think is just getting better and better and better and better. Um we saw him his, his defensive wrestling against Askarov was phenomenal. When he got taken down, he got back up. He defended some really solid rear naked chokes, uh, striking his on point. I mean, I mean, his straight right and then his overhand are just beautiful. Those are money makers. So it's a one, two, a double jab, two, um, either straight or loops it over the top as an overhand. Gosh, beautiful. But he misses with a lot of hooks. I think his height, I think his reach, you see him leading with hooks a lot. And in the first Moreno fight, we saw him coming out swinging um, overhands and then a lot of left hooks, and he was just missing and missing and missing. And then what he did beautifully was he was throwing that jab to the body, right to Moreno's chest. And, and when you do that, you kind of step in deep, and he would level change and really step in and close the distance on that jab, and he would jab under Moreno's jab, and then he would jab cleanly. And then what he would start to do is it looks like the same step. So it looks like it's going to be a jab to the body, but he would throw that jab up top and then fire either double jab or just a one, two up top. And that's where he hurt Moreno with a couple times in that first round. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful transitions, beautiful reads. He went from throwing hooks where they weren't landing through those ones to the body and up top. Amazing. Then round two hit and all Moreno did was walk him down and Kaikara France had no answer to it at all. None. He could not fight backing up on his bicycle. He wasn't throwing jabs. He was literally just trying to run, cover up, and run. Same thing in round three, again and again. And, and honestly, in that Askarov fight, when Askarov is marching Kaikara France down and walking him down, Kaikara France's just offense is shut down. When Kaikara France is going forward, all offense looks amazing, cannot be touched pressuring people looks of just a freaking amazing. The only time we really saw him do anything much is, uh, I think it was a third round. Askarov was just marching him down and, and Kaikara finally threw a straight right and backed him up and went, um, this fight to me is about who is going forward. And I, I think we saw it against Figueredo as well, that Moreno is such a pressure. Eh, I mean, in that fight, they were tempered a little bit more, but when, uh, when Moreno would go forward, uh, Figueredo would shoot on him. And, and that was a beautiful idea. He, I, he didn't get most of those takedowns, but it stopped Moreno from coming forward. And then when Moreno is at distance, he's not that good. He's, he's not that good when he sits on the outside. He gets kicked. He gets jabbed. His, he's a little chinny. Um, but man, when he is going forward, it is everything. Um, earlier, I was leaning Kaikara France. Honestly, I'm a little torn on this one. I, I honestly don't know. I think Moreno ha has the championship rounds. I think he has the confidence. Um, he's now with James Krause. He switched camps, which is going to help him with the attention, but it's going to hurt him in the two steps forward, one step back thing. And, and what I mean by that is anytime you're learning something new, you like you're not great at it yet. And so if you're if you're trying all of these new techniques, but you're really not proficient at everything you're doing, you're not 
going to do them very well. And then you're not doing the techniques that you're used to doing. And so there's a little bit of that lag. And then once you get better at these new techniques and then you add them into your old techniques, then it's good, but there's a, a, a learning curve. And I'm curious to see if, if that happens here. But I do think that James Krause, I believe this is his first world championship camp. I think he is going to put a lot of time into Moreno and, uh, you know, I think, man, I think I'm leaning Moreno here. Um, and, and a razor close thing. And earlier today, I was thinking Kai Kara France. I love his power. I, I love his defensive wrestling. I love, I freaking love Kai Kara France. And I think Moreno is going to march him down, and that is going to give Kai Kara France too many problems. I. It's funny that you circled back to Moreno. Be, oh, sorry, one sec. My AirPods just started playing. Oh. I was like, round two, what the hell are you talking about? Um, it's funny that uh, you circled back to Moreno because I came to the exact same place. So after watching the film and then thinking about Kai Kara and, okay, how would this fight play out and how have his previous fights played out? Okay, this is lying decently close. I mean, Moreno's a, you know, what, minus 200 favorite and, and Kai Kara is a, a decent underdog and he's been an underdog his last few fights. But this is a completely different style from what his last few fights have been. I mean, Askar Askarov, I even said this the last time, and I had picked Askarov and played him huge. I took a big bath on that fight. I mean, it was horrible. But I said, the one thing that concerns me is he throws nothing on the feet. He throws no volume. So in this day and age, right, when it's, uh, you know, damage over control, and he started defending takedowns well and just getting that, <sighs> all right, here we go. You know, it, it, it's easy for him to win a decision there and look great, and and that's a good favorable matchup for him, just like you said, you know. And let's see, fight before that, he fought Cody Garbrandt, which you know, extremely chinny as is, and then you put him at twenty five, so hard to take much from that one. You know, Kai obviously looked great, knocked him out, awesome, no problem. I would rate Brandon Moreno's chin way above a one twenty five Cody Garbrandt's chin. I mean, that's probably not a debate. Okay, Rogerio Bontarine, who had him in a lot of trouble before he finally just got put out, right? So the way that I look at this, um, okay, the thing with Moreno too that was scaring me was I remember the Moreno of old who was always pressing people, always game, always in your face. And then I remember, you know, being there watching him fight Figueredo and he's not, you know, he was on the outside. He was, you know, standing there and looking super unimpressive and low volume. And he didn't understand how to engage and how to get there. But then all things considered, he's standing across the cage from, from Davison Figueredo who hits like a freaking Mack truck. Who's ultra athletic in every category and can take him down anytime he wants to. Um, that's a tough task and it's hard to, to press forward on that. Right. I mean, just the things that Figueredo was doing was throwing his head into such a, a whirlwind. It is like, he's still trying to figure out the puzzle while having the dog in him at the same time. But watching the first fight, I mean, yeah, you're right. Round one, he, he, he lost on two judges scorecards on the third. He won. But as soon as he started big brothering him, he just looked, he was just big brother. He was just smacking him and check hooking him, throwing the jab, the straight hitting him with pretty much whatever he wanted. And one thing I noticed with Kai Kara is when he is on that back foot and he's throwing, his punches are so loopy and almost predictable, right? It's one big blitz at a time. Um, I think Moreno just, his punches were so much tighter and so much cleaner than Kai's. He, he just flows a little bit better, kind of like the Mexican boxing. So I, I think in this fight, we're going to see the Moreno of old, you know, when he doesn't have Davis and Figueredo standing across from him. And I think the result is going to be the same. I, I like Moreno here. I think he does have the grappling upside if he needs it. But even if he's just going to stand and strike, I like him to be in Kai's face, chasing him down, peppering him up. I, I think this is a, a great spot for Moreno. Yeah, and going on what you said about the Figueredo thing is Fig Figueredo fought him strangely too, where he wasn't engaging and Figueredo was keeping the distance and then throwing that calf kick. And so he didn't know how to, like you said, he didn't know like, how do, how do you engage that? Like, that's a weird thing to engage. And the other thing here is we've seen that Moreno can go five rounds and it's just comp He has confidence. He has confidence. He has confidence. Split decision loss to, to Figueredo. And, you know, Kai Kara is... I wouldn't say he has cardio issues, but he's not like some amazing cardio crazy guy. Um, 
I, I just I, I worry about the the fourth and the fifth round with Kai Kara. And really, like you said, it's it's on the back foot. When he's on the back foot, he's throwing looping punches, oh. which come up short. When he's is a going five round forward, fight. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, I really like Moreno then. Yeah. I mean, Moreno has the experience. He knows what to do. Now, man, Kai Kara is tough. He could cl- If Kai Kara is moving forward, then Kai Kara can win this. I think Kai Kara will win this. Um and if Moreno is moving forward and Kai Kara is shooting and countering back, Kai Kara can win this. We just haven't seen Kai Kara be pressured and do those things. So what makes us think that he's going to do it now? Um, yeah, I think I think Moreno wins this, and uh, I think he's the interim champ. And then I think we see Figueredo Moreno eighty seven, and uh, or Pantoja and uh, and uh, Moreno three. Yeah, that could happen as well. That could happen. Because okay, well. first of all, Davidson's fat as hell. I mean, that dude's got to weigh 125 kilos, not even pounds. He's probably 125 kilos now. He is thickest in Figueredo, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they're doing with him, um, but man, I, I, th- I think it's a good spot. I think it's a good spot here. I think it's a good spot for for Moreno. All right, main event time. Juliana Pena, Amanda Nunes. What are we thinking on this one? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I mean, like, I, I, I didn't watch tape on this. Um, like I said, I, I, I've been traveling. I gave Juliana Pena absolutely zero shot to beat Amanda Nunez um, prior. Like I, I was like, ah, this is Nunez, whatever. And every time I do that, I think every time the whole world discounts people like that, they end up getting that upset. Um, you know, I, I'm going to post more on the Patreon uh, on this because this one and, and then that Pantoja one, um, I think there was one other one I wanted to really look at. I mean, you know, Amanda Nunez really is that freaking good. Her wrestling is really that good. Um off the top of my head, I'm thinking Pena just caught her slipping. Um, I don't know that we're going to see that again. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm leaning uh, uh, Nunez here. I'm going to watch some tape, throw it on the Patreon uh, for all you people. Um, but, but really, I, I, I didn't watch tape on this, and I don't want to give you guys a false sense of uh, BS and make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. And in reality, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, well, this is another women's MMA fight, so I'm going to make a pick. And if it wins, you should have listened to me. And if it loses, no, I'm just kidding. I, I didn't do a lot of tape on this one either. But last time these two fought, I had my little bad dream. I had a $15,000 parlay that needed to be capped off by Amanda Nunez. I was feeling pretty nice. I put in a $700 hedge on, uh, on, on Juliana Pena. And I had said it in the chat all week. I was like, guys, I don't know why I feel like you know Pena could win this. Like, cardio gases are out you know pena sticks around she doesn't die like she has horrible striking horrible everything but i i weirdly think she can win this fight uh i think it's i think you'd be remiss not to take uh you know decent odds on amanda nunez who is the better fighter has a history of championship you know experience and she maybe has a chip on her shoulder. I mean, how embarrassing is that? That last fight to get choked out by Juliana Pena and you talking all this trash and it's so easy, so easy, so easy. She has had no competition for years and years and years. She, you know, everyone's like, she's just fighting for the paycheck. She just keeps getting paid by whooping these girls in one round. Well, now she has something to fight for. Now it's a little bit different. You know, it's silk sheets, but she's like, hey, this is my legacy on the line, not so much money. I'm sure she's good. She's probably set for the rest of her life. So uh, I think we'd be remiss not to take Amanda Nunes at a minus 200 number. I mean, we haven't seen that in years, and we probably won't see that again for a long time, you know, if she wins here. So um, I'm going to go Amanda Nunes again. If that wins, I'm the smartest human being on the planet. And if it loses, you guys should always, you know, fade my uh, my women's MMA picks. I love it. Um, you know, you're saying the same thing. Like, when's the last time we saw a minus two in front of – Amanda Nunez with three numbers, not four. Usually it's minus 2000. Yeah. And 
you know, I, I, I think you're probably right. Like, man, minus 275. We're never going to see odds like that again on Nunez. Um, I, I like it. I like, I like Nunez. You know, I, again, I, I got to watch tape. If what I'm thinking is happening is will happen, you know, minus 275 for the man in Nunez, it's probably not a bad go of things. Um, man, now you guys, uh, we've got a lot coming up because Contender is back. So, if you guys want, I mean, that's pretty much the end of this show, but man, if you guys really want to do some things, sign up for the Patreon and the Discord. Um, you killed it on Contender today, and you, you made some good money. I mean, it was week one, and the weeks, I mean, the fights will be rolling out, so you guys check out the Patreon, check out the Discord. You made a shitload of money this week. I'm sad because I was in England and made nothing. Well, I opened up a new DK account, and uh, I put in five grand. And in uh, what a span of like three days, so from Friday, Saturday, you know, four days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's gone from 5,000 to 25,000. And I'm already getting caught with the limits, which sucks. I, I tried to win uh, just like $2,000 on each fight and I'm, I'm getting hit with the, the sad limits. So logistics, that's, that's half the battle there. So fun times. We love <laughs> contender series. Oh man, well, you guys, uh, like I said, check out our Patreon, check out our Discord, uh, grab my memoir, it's in the show notes, uh, and man, happy betting. Hey, uh, actually, never mind, we'll save this for next week. All right, guys, thank you so much. See you guys.